and welcome to Acoustic Guitar Tools for Worship. My name is David Harsh. I use the acoustic guitar for songwriting, performing, and worship leading. And I'm excited to share with you some of the tools that I've developed on this incredible instrument throughout the course of my career so far. I've designed this class within the context of contemporary Christian worship music. And with that in mind, we're going to be playing in mostly common time signatures and major keys with their corresponding diatonic chords. I'm going to be playing on a standard tuned acoustic six string guitar. But if you're playing, for instance, a 12 string guitar or an electric guitar, or you're even a songwriter, I think you'll probably still get quite a bit out of this lesson. I've broken this lesson into two separate parts. The first part deals with the rhythmic aspect and the strumming hand. The second part deals with the harmonic aspect and the fretting hand. If I move at a pace that's a little bit faster than you would like, I encourage you to use that pause button and to take each section one at a time. Let's get started. Okay, let's get into some strumming. But before we do, I want to make sure we're kind of strumming on the same page. I usually strum with a pick, and I hold the pick fairly gently, kind of like a blessing from God. I don't hold on to it too tightly. Also, I want to encourage you to take your fretting hand and gently place it against the strings so that you can mute the strings while we strum, so we can focus more on the strumming hand. I think strumming is a lot like a racket sport. Not tennis, not ping pong, but badminton, the best balance of both worlds, with a little bit of wrist and a little bit of arm. As we strum, what goes up must come down, and what goes down must come up. So we're constantly staying in motion, and usually the beats are the down strums, and the off beats are the up strums, as in one and two and. Now if we get into smaller note values, like 16th notes, then we're gonna be going down on one and, and we're going to be coming up on E and A. Uh. In other words, one E and A, uh, two E and A. Uh. I've created a strumming legend so that you can kind of get inside my head and see what it is that I'm trying to communicate with my strumming patterns. A down strum is indicated by a red arrow. An up strum is indicated by a blue arrow. Silent strums are indicated by dotted arrows and then strums that are accented with extra emphasis are indicated by an arrow with a dot or a ball on the end. And then later on we'll talk about the up strum that's delayed in the sense of shuffling or swinging. And that's indicated by a green arrow with a wider tip. Okay, let's get our strumming hand a little bit loose and just do some basic rhythms. Most of the worship songs that I've encountered have been in 4-4 four, four time, which means we have four beats in a measure and a quarter note gets a beat. Occasionally we'll be in 3-4 time where we have three beats in a measure. But let's just start with some straight quarter notes in 4-4 four, four time. One, two, three, four. Down, 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 down. Pretty straightforward, okay? Now I'd like you to add the off beats, in other words, the up strummed eighth notes. Three, four, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay, now I'd like you to do just the off beat eighth notes. In other words, take away the beats. Ready, go. One, two, three, four. And, 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 up, 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 up. One, two, three, four. Very good. Okay, now we're going to get into 16th notes, which are much smaller note values, which means your hand is going to move a lot faster. One, two, three, four. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a down up, 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 down up. And if you want, you can accent each of the four beats as I'm doing. Okay, that's probably the smallest note value you're going to play. You can take eighth notes and make them all down strums in the case of slow rock or fast rock, like in punk rock. One and two and three and four and down and down 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 down. I believe that punk rock players are eventually going to look down and their right arm will have fallen off. But those are some basic straight strumming pattern 
forms, and we're actually going to get into some strumming patterns in just a minute, now that our strumming hand is loose. Okay, let's explore some strumming patterns, but even before we do, let's just talk a little bit about strumming. Most people, when they strum, they do it intuitively. They don't necessarily think about what they're doing, they just kind of strum and make it happen. For me, I like to move from intuitively to intentionally. I like to understand why certain strumming patterns work for certain chord sequences and for certain songs, for certain tempos, certain grooves. So I kind of like to take them a little bit apart. I don't think that takes away the mystery. In fact, I think it helps us to understand music that much more. And uh, some of the strums are not actually going to be voiced. When we strum, we don't just strum every single beat like this. That's just kind of a wall of sound. So think of it like a sculptor who takes a large block of marble and he sculpts a way to reveal a beautiful statue. It's what's not there that reveals the beautiful contours of the music. It's when we're not strumming that the characteristic of the strumming pattern is defined. So you want to keep your hand moving all the time and I'm going to go ahead and start with a strumming pattern you've probably heard before. It's one that I grew up listening to even before I even knew what a guitar was, basically. And uh, I affectionately call it the Presbyterian strum. I grew up Presbyterian and I went to Presbyterian camps and stuff and this is a strumming pattern that I heard. Now if that doesn't take you back to camp, I don't know what will. Okay, now I'm going to play this exact same strumming pattern, the Presbyterian strum, three different ways, but only one way is going to be strummed correctly. They're all going to be rhythmically correct, but only one way is going to be correctly strummed. See if you can identify which version is correct. Here's version A. One, two, three, four. Down, up, up. Down, 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 down. 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 Okay? Here's version B. Two, three, four. Down, down, up, up, down, up, 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 down. All right. And lastly, version C. Two, three, four. Down, up, 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 down. Okay. So which version was strummed correctly? It's version B. Version A was all over the place. It's almost not even worth discussing. Version C, however, I want to take a moment to look at with you because there are two distinct points in that way that I was strumming that were actually decent sized errors that could lead to imprecise playing. They were located on the and of one and beat three. Basically, I went down and instead of coming up silently on the and of one, I waited and then I came up on beat two, but unfortunately that set the rest of the strumming pattern on a course toward imprecise playing. You want to be able to play really solidly. So if you look at version B, you'll see that the down strums were on the beat and the up strums were on the off beats, even the ones that were not voiced. Now why do I go to all this trouble? Well basically as we strum we're kind of learning to walk. And when we walk, we just go right, left, right, left, right, left. We don't go right, 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 left, right, left, 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 right. We want to strum consistently and constantly so that we don't even have to think about the rhythm of our strumming hand. We can focus on making music and playing solid grooves. So I want us to be able to run and walk and not limp. So with that in mind, let's play the Presbyterian strum. I'm going to add the arrows back in and I want you to play it with me. And we'll count it and we'll say the arrows. One, two, three, four. Down, down, up. Up, down, up, down, down, up. Up, down, up. One, two, and. And four, and. One, two, and. And four, and. Now you might think to yourself, well, that's kind of an old school strum. I might not use that. Or you might be thinking, wow, that's my staple strum. That's what I use for every song that I play. Well, I use it on a lot of worship songs, but I also use it when I write music. I want to just show you just a little sliver of a chorus for one of my songs where I'm using the Presbyterian strum. And before you think that it sounds a little old school, consider what your fretting hand can do to add different textures, as well as taking your strumming hand and moving it around the strings to take this strum, which seems a little simple, and make it a little bit more elaborate. Listen to what I can do here. That's the 
Presbyterian strum right there. Now I want to move to the piano strum. I call it the piano strum because it kind of emulates what a piano player does when he or she kind of vamps on some even chords leading into possibly a slower worship song. And what this kind of sounds like is this do, go, do, go, do, go, do, go, do, go, do, go, one, and three, and four, and one, and three, and four, and down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Up, down, up, down, up, down. What you'll notice is that there is a full beat of silence that takes place. It's the second half of the first beat and the first half of the second beat. And what that could lead to is the hand staying and then moving back up again, but we don't want that, right? Because that could lead to imprecise playing. So as long as the hand continues to move steadily like a pendulum, you'll keep perfect time. This particular strumming pattern works really well for chord progressions with changes on beats one and three. In other words, half note, half note, like this. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, one, and three, and four, and one and three and four and one. So that's the piano strum. Inevitably, you're gonna come across three, four time in some of the worship songs that you play. And when you do, you're gonna play some variation of this strum where we have three beats in a measure. One, two, three. Down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down. One, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and. Pretty straightforward, but it's distinct. And usually your changes are going to be on each downbeat, like this. Now I'd like to get to a more complex strum that you may also already have in your toolkit. I call it the 3 plus 3 plus 2 strum. Now normally a measure of 4 has 4 beats, so technically this is the 1.5 plus one and a half plus one strum, where that adds up to four, but that's, that's a little bit more complex to think about. So I'd rather you think of it as three plus three plus two, which adds up to eight. And as we strum this, you basically have a group of three, a group of three, and a group of two, like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Now you want to be careful and not make it three plus three plus three, like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Because what have we done? We've just played the previous strum that's in three, four time. So make sure you take that additional beat off so you have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Now, if you look closely, we'll break this into three separate boxes so you can actually see on the diagram that there are three beats, three beats, and two beats. These make wonderful places for chord changes to take place. For instance, on the and of two. So if we count one and a two e and three e and a four and a one and a two e and three e and a four and a. Okay? You could also say down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down. But if you're on beat two and, in other words, the and two, you could have a chord change like this. You probably caught that I actually resolved that D sus to a D on beat four. This also works if you want to change on beat four like this. strumming pattern because it's also interesting if you're just strumming a single chord continuously. I'll play four cycles of this and I'll just sustain a D and I think it'll be still interesting to the ear. Now if I were to take one of the previous strums and play four continuous cycles of one chord, it might not be as interesting to the ear. So very helpful strum. The last strum we're going to focus on I call the triple down strum. And by the way, 
these strums don't all have names. You can call them, you know, Lucy, Ricky, Fred, and Ethel if you want to. I've just given them names so that I can identify what these particular strumming patterns are. If you see someone using this strum and you say, oh, he's using the 3 plus 3 plus 2 strum, he's going to say the what strum? So this is just a way for me to kind of separate and delineate what they are. So here's the triple down strum. I call it the triple down strum because the first three strums are all down. And the third one is accented like this. Down, 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 up, down, up, down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, up, down, 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 up, one, and two, and a three, e, and four, and a one, and two, and a three, e, and four, and a. This is a very popular strum, and uh, it sounds great, too. So those are some helpful strumming patterns for you to get started with. Here are a few other helpful strumming tips for you. Um, consider the harmonic rhythm. The harmonic rhythm is the rate at which the chords change. So for instance, if you had chord changes on beats one and three, you know, long half note chords, you'd probably want to be able to make use of the piano strum. However, if you had a change on the and of two, you might want to use the three plus three plus two strum. At least be aware of how the chords are changing. The other thing is, think about the tempo of the song. Certain strumming patterns really come to life at faster tempo. Other strumming patterns are meant for slower tempo. So just be aware of how you're using these strumming patterns. Sometimes it's nice to use them in conjunction with other strumming patterns, in combinations. Generally speaking, worship songs are a little bit simpler in their song form and can tend to be verse, chorus, there might be a second verse, and then just kind of repeat the chorus. Now there are exceptions. There are worship songs that have pre-choruses and bridges and all kinds of stuff. But with simpler song forms, you're probably going to have fewer strumming patterns that you're going to make use of. Uh, I tend to use two, maybe three strumming patterns in worship songs, but again, there are always exceptions. I just wouldn't use the same strumming pattern throughout an entire song. It starts to kind of feel the same. Remember, we're not necessarily leading musicians in worship. We're leading people in worship. And if it starts to just kind of feel the same, like we're using the same strumming pattern throughout, even though the chords are changing or even, you know, we're moving to a new key or whatever, it's still going to start to kind of feel the same. I encourage you to find the best strumming pattern for the section of the song. Multiple strumming patterns might work in a song or in certain sections, but usually there's one or two that works really well. Not all the strums have to be equal in length or intensity, and sometimes it's better if you have certain strums that are accented or up-accented or, you know, whatever. You've got this flow going where you're basically strumming with intensity and lightness, and this creates this whole landscape rather than just strumming, you know. You can do. Take strums away. And also, not all strums have to be voiced. Sometimes it's nice to strum down on muted strings like this. That can create a real percussive sound. Also, try isolating the bass notes, especially if you're the only guitar player or maybe have the only instrument on stage. You can kind of be your own bass player. that I like to do is take the 3 plus 3 plus 2 strum and add kind of a landscape to it. So I'll take the bass notes in say, you know, G, C, E minor, D, and this might work in some chord progressions and, and not work in others, but I'll mute the bass notes. Now I'm not talking about muting the entire chord like in 80s music, I'm just talking about selective palm muting where the, the strumming hand is gently resting against the strings. You probably noticed that I hammered on a couple of notes here. 
You can also hammer on some notes in the middle and then pull them off like this. And then to add to that, you can strum up on the treble notes and make them kind of ring across the bar line to contrast the muted notes like this. Okay, so put it all together and you have something like this. In my opinion, that's a lot more interesting to the ear than just... We've got... Another aspect that I want to talk about briefly is shuffling or swinging. And if you're a procrastinator, you're going to love this. Because what we do is we strum down on the beat, but then we wait until the last possible moment to come up on that offbeat. So it's written as straight eighth notes like this, one and two and three and four and, but what we actually do is we kind of hobble along a little bit. We do kind of the triplet feel. It actually sounds as the first and third notes of a triplet like this. And this travels into multiple genres and styles of music, way beyond worship music. So we have one, two, a three, a four, da, 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 triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. So let's take this style and apply it to a few of the strums we've already discovered, okay? The Presbyterian strum, which is... Now becomes... strum sounds kind of cool too. It's a little different. It's one, two, and three, and here's how we shuffle it. A little different. And then let's take the triple down strum, which is Let's swing that too, shuffle it, like this. Something like that. Anyway, that's the triple down strum with, with kind of a swing shuffle to it, as it were. Hopefully this section has given you kind of a springboard for listening to the strumming patterns of other guitar players and kind of identifying what those are. And then also listening to the strumming patterns that you're doing and maybe changing them up a bit, taking a little bit more ownership of what you're doing and then creating strumming patterns. So that's the rhythmic section of this class. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears to the fretting hand and the harmonic aspect of the guitar. But before we get into it, I'm hoping we can be on the same page with some of the nomenclature I'm going to be using. Let's talk about the fingerings of the fretting hand. If you're a piano player, your thumbs are one, but we're actually going to start with the index finger as one. We're going to go one, two, three, and four. And if you're going to end up wrapping the thumb around for any chords, that's usually indicated by T for thumb. The strings are numbered from treble to bass, one to six, but I'm going to be focusing from the sixth string to the first string. So we'll go ahead and say the names of the open strings, and they are E, A, D, G, B, and E. There's a great mnemonic device to remember those string names, and it's Eddie Eight Dynamite. Goodbye, Eddie. Let's make sure that we're in tune. If you have a tuner, you're probably already in tune with me, but these are my 12 fret harmonics. I think they're easier to hear than uh, the low notes. 
but I encourage you to use your tuner to get in tune. Um, let's talk just briefly about notation. I'm not going to be referencing notation a lot in this lesson, but in your guitar journey, you're going to probably see words with chord names above them and occasionally chord shapes in like what I call chord waffles. And then you'll incorporate tablature at some point, but inevitably you're going to come across notation for guitar. The guitar is notated in treble clef. And these are the open guitar string notes in treble clef from bass to treble. E, A, D, G, B, E. Now it's interesting to note that the guitar is actually notated an octave higher than it actually sounds. And this is to prevent the use of too many ledger lines. And ledger lines are those little lines that go below and above the clef for notes that exist outside the clef. This is what the treble clef would look like with the guitar notes notated in concert pitch. Now, seven ledger lines is way too many ledger lines for me to read. So I asked myself the question, why not use bass clef then? Well, at first glance, this might look like a good solution because there's only one ledger line below bass clef. But if you want to play any of these notes up here on the first string, it's going to take you five ledger lines and higher. So it turns out that the treble clef is actually the ideal clef with the guitar notated an octave higher than concert pitch because you have three ledger lines below the clef and then as many as about three ledger lines above the clef. Now, the guitar is tuned in perfect fourths. That's the Here Comes the Bride interval. Ah, but we get to the third and second strings, and we have what's called a major third. But then we go back to the perfect fourth between strings two and one. Now, why is the guitar not tuned to perfect fourths? Why is there that accommodation made for that major third between strings three and two? Well, that's basically because we want to be able to play full six string major or minor movable chords. In other words, if the guitar was tuned in fourths, this chord here, which is a bar chord, which we'll talk about in a little bit, would have to be played like this. In other words, we would need an extra finger to play this chord or the minor version as well. Now we could play partial versions of the chords, and we could also play melodies, but there's a very real need for us to be able to play full six string chords up and down the neck. And that is why the guitar is not tuned in fourths all the way across. At this point, I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn and I'm going to use another instrument to help us understand this instrument. I believe that all roads lead from the piano. In our 12-tone system of Western music, every note that's played is either a white key or a black key. So I wondered at one point what the guitar might look like if I were to highlight and map it out with all white keys and all black keys, rather than just the standard inlay. Now I know that there are some guitars out there that have inlay that notates the black and white keys, but that only works in standard tuning because the minute you move to another tuning, the inlays don't work for you. So what I want you to be able to do is to look at a standard inlay on a guitar and be able to find some of the white and black keys. So this is the piano fretboard that I've created. It's a chart that basically has the six strings in vertical strips and you see the groups of black keys and the groups of white keys that all work together to make this incredible guitar understandable like a piano might be. Let's take a moment and just look at the piano you'll see that we've got the white keys, which are the natural notes, and the black keys, which I'm gonna call the sharp or flat notes. Now, it's music theory, not music fact, so there are actual instances where you have white keys that are sharp or flat, etc., and then we even get into double sharp or double flat, if you get into higher volume key signatures with accidentals and all that kind of crazy stuff. So for our purposes, we're gonna call the white keys the naturals, and the black keys the sharps or the flats. Now, the black keys are in groups of two and three. And the white keys, every time you have a set of two white keys, there is a black key between them, with the exception of two instances of juxtaposed white keys. And those are between B and C and E and F. If you look at the guitar, you will find that it is no exception to what the piano does. Even though you can't see them, they are there. Every B has a C directly above it. And throughout the entire guitar, every E has an F above it. 
So what I'd like to have you do is join me in mapping out this fretboard. We'll become aware of the black keys, which are in groups of three and two, or groups of two and three. We're gonna learn all the notes on the sixth string and the fifth string. We're gonna be able to find those notes very quickly. So go ahead and use your index finger, your first finger of your fretting hand, and I want you to walk up and down the sixth string. We're gonna name these notes as we go, and every time we play a black key on the way up, it's going to have a sharp next to it. On the way down, those same black keys are gonna have a flat next to it because they are the inharmonic equivalents, and it's all a question of context. We're also gonna stop at the bass notes of two open major chords that we know, as well as some notes that correspond to open guitar strings that we might know. Okay, so let's get started. Let's start with the E string. Here we go, the low bass E string. This is E, right away we move to F. Say these with me if you would. This is F sharp, and then we get to G, which is the bass note of our G open major chord that we learned back in the day. Continuing now to G sharp, and here's A, which is the same note as the open fifth string A. Continue now to A sharp, there's B, careful, C, C sharp, there's D, which is the same note as the open fourth string D, and then D sharp, and lastly back to E. Now remember, it's a 12 tone scale, so there are only 12 notes. And when you get to the 12th fret, you're playing the same notes as the open strings. They're not the same pitches, they're an octave above, but that double dot reflects that we're on the same exact note that we started with just an octave higher. Let's go down now on this E string. Here we go. E, E flat, D, D flat, C, careful, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, G flat, F, and E. Now what I'd like to do is to play all the natural tones up and down the E string. What we're going to end up playing is something called the E Phrygian mode, which is the third scale based on the C major scale. So it's not going to have the F sharp, which would make it sound the E natural minor scale. So let's play the E Phrygian mode, or all the natural tones on the sixth string. Here we go. E, F, G, A, B, C, D, back to E. Let's go backwards now. E, D, C, B, A, G, F, and E. Let's take this a step further now. I want you to memorize four locations on this string. Two of them you probably already know. The open E and the 12th fret E. Then I want you to memorize the 5th fret A and the 7th fret B. Okay, commit those to memory. E, A, B, and E. Now I'd like to have you join me in this exact same process for the 5th string, which is the A string. Here we go. A, a sharp, B, C, and this is the bass note of an open C major chord. Continuing now to C sharp, there's D, which is the open fourth string. D sharp, E, careful, F, F sharp, G, which is the open third string. And then G sharp, and we're back to A. Let's go backwards now. A, A flat, G, G flat, F, E, E flat, D, D flat, C, B, B flat, and A. Let's play the natural tones on the fifth string, which make up the A Aeolian mode, which is better known as the A natural minor scale. Here we go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Let's go backwards now, descending. A, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Let's also mark these four locations on the A string. We have the open A and the 12th fret A. Then we have the 5th fret D and the 7th fret E. Memorize those. A, D, E, and A. This is like a vast desert. And these little points are little oases little marker points that you can stop at to be able to find out where you are. If you are able to memorize these locations, then you will never have to travel more than two frets to get to any note in the chromatic scale. In some cases, you'll only have to travel one fret, and in other cases, you won't even have to travel at all because the note that I might name could be one of the oases. Let's test it out. Let's take the note C sharp. 
Now rather than taking the sixth string and going all the way up to find that, I'm going to say this is B, which I know is only two frets away from C sharp. Let's try it on the fifth string to see where that's located. Here's the D. Down a half step is D flat. Now D flat is the enharmonic equivalent of C sharp. So we found it. Let's try E flat. Now we know that on the sixth string we can't go any further than this note because the string is tuned to E. But we can go to the twelfth fret and go down a half step. We also know that on the fifth string, on the seventh fret, there's an E. We can go down a half step to find E flat. Let's say we needed to find A. Well, the good news about A is it's already one of our oases. It's the fifth fret of the sixth string and also the open and 12th fret of the 5th string. Let's do one more. Let's do G sharp. Well, the note we just found, the A, is right next door to A flat, which is also enharmonically equivalent to G sharp. And we can do that here as well. So let's take this piano fretboard to a new level with my fretboard zones map. What I've done is I've created a rainbow of zones that shows you the distribution of the registers of the notes. Now, the red zone contains these five notes. And once we've passed the G sharp, we're now beginning to play the A, which exists on the fifth string. So these five notes, E, F, F sharp, G, and G sharp, cannot be found anywhere else on the guitar in their exact pitches. If you want those notes, you have to play them right here. We move from, a, from the red zone into the orange zone, into the yellow zone, the green zone, and then finally into the blue zone. Let's look at the piano just for a moment. This note right here, this is the E above middle C. How many places on a 88 key piano can you find this exact pitch? The answer is only one. If you want to play that pitch on the piano, you have to play it there. But how many places can we find it on a six string guitar? Let's find out. Well, the first string played open is that same E. The second string at the fifth fret is the same note. The third string at the ninth fret, same note. Fourth string at the 14th fret is there. And the fifth string at the 19th fret is there. And then if we had 24 frets, we could play it right here. Some guitars actually have fretboards that kind of jut into the sound hole, but there's a harmonic node there that tells us where our 24th fret would be. So in answer to the question, how many places can that E be found on the guitar? Well, the answer is one, two, three, four, five, six. You can even play the same chord. Let's say we had, you know, a four note chord like D major. We could play that there open, but we could also play it on the fifth fret and then even on the 10th fret. Now the way the guitar is distributed, if you have that single E and you want to play it on the next string over, you have a six fret leap right here between strings one and two from open to five. But if you move from five to nine between strings three and two, actually technically between strings two and three, you only have a five fret spread. Now why is that? That's because of our major third interval between those two strings. So as one final exercise, as you claim the fretboard, see if you can find all the C's that exist between frets 0 and 12, okay? Actually, technically 0 and 11, or 1 and 12, because we're dealing with 12 tones. Okay, we already know where two of those are, because you know in a C major chord, you have C, E, G, C, E. So we found two of our C's already, as the second string and the fifth string. You can use octaves to find the third string, and then the first string, and then the sixth string, and finally the fourth string. Because if you continued on here, you'd be at the, f the 13th fret, and you'd be playing a new segment of Cs. So in other words, we have six strings on the guitar, 12 tones on each string. How many times does a single tone appear on each of the strings? Once. So then how many Cs exist between here and here? Six. Here they are again. Strings two, five, three, one, six, and four. So that's a little bit of an insight into the piano fretboard and claiming all of these notes. Okay, now let's talk about playing diatonic chords in major keys. I'm sure you've probably heard the expression, we're playing in the key of. Well, to be able to play in the key of something, you need to know the chords that exist in that key. 
Now, to prepare ourselves for this activity, I want to do a little bit of review with you of a couple of root position movable bar chords. This one is shaped like an E. Technically, it's an A chord, right? Because my bass note is right here on the sixth string. Okay, you're probably familiar with this shape. This is the other major shape I'd like to focus on. This is shaped like an A. And what's the name of the chord? It's actually a D chord because it's on the fifth fret of the fifth string. Okay, so this is one and two major chords I'd like you to focus on. There are three others, but these are the two that I tend to favor the most. Then there's a minor version of each. This is the E minor shape. You can see E minor kind of hiding in there even though it's an A minor chord. And then over here is the A minor shape, which is technically a D minor chord. So we have the E major shape, the A major shape, the E minor shape, and the A minor shape. Those are our bar chords we're gonna keep handy for moving around the neck in the diatonic chords for these various keys. There's one chord that I do wanna show you that you may be familiar with, but you're probably not gonna use all that much. But in the interest of completing the entire picture and being able to play all the diatonic chords in one key, I'm gonna show it to you. This is the diminished chord, okay? And this is the shape based on the sixth string. Okay, and here's the shape based on the fifth string. It's kind of a, a crunchy chord. It's got this interval in it called the, the tritone. And why is it called a tritone? Because it's got three whole tones that frame it. It's a little bit more dissonant. And with that in mind, it's not as common to hear this style of accord in contemporary Christian worship music, but it finds its way into a lot of other styles and genres of music. Okay, so if you can play these four major and minor shapes, you can basically play any major or minor chord possible because you have claimed these two strings up and down the neck. And if you can play these to diminished shapes, then you can basically play all the chords that exist diatonically to some of the keys that we're gonna work on right now. Now, let's look at the keyboard one more time. If I were to play this for you, you would hear a C major scale. Well, what we can do is we can build a chord on each of those degrees and we have what's called a harmonized scale. This is the one chord, C major, say them with me if you know it, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, a minor, and then there's that B diminished, and we're back to C. These chords have specific names. The one chord is called the tonic. The minor two is called the supertonic. The minor three is called the mediant. The major four is the subdominant, which leads to the major five, which is the dominant. The minor six is the submediant, and then you've got the diminished seven, which is the leading tone and it leads back to the tonic. The one, four, and five are the majors. The two, three, and six are the minors, and then the seven is the diminished. So let's play all the chords in the keys of C, G, D, A, and E major. Take a look at the table that I've put together. I've got the Roman numerals for one to seven, and you'll see that I've capitalized the major chord Roman numerals. I've made lowercase the minor chord Roman numerals, and then the diminished seven has a little degree on it that says that it's a diminished chord, a diminished triad. Now, this is a product of my classical background. They have something in Nashville called the Nashville number system. And what they use that for is to give numeric numbers and symbols for each of these chord degrees. And that enables you to play in different keys. The same principle applies to what we're doing. Um, but you'll see that the green chords in this table indicate chords that are usually available as open chords. And you probably know that you can play an open chord as a movable closed voicing bar chord, which we're gonna try as well. The yellow chords are typically known more as closed voicing bar chords. And then I've got the red chords in the seven column, which are the diminished chords. So let's start with the key of C major. You can say the names of these chords with me out loud if you'd like as we play. Here we go. C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, a minor, and then B diminished, leading back to C major. Now, if this is easy for you, try playing these as closed voicings using the shapes we've recently discussed. C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished, back to C major. Now, the key of C has no sharps or flats. Now, we're going to move to the key of G, which has one sharp, which is located on F sharp. Here we go. G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, 
F sharp diminished back to G major. And has closed voicings. G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, F sharp diminished back to G major. Okay, let's move to the key of D major, which has two sharps, which are an F sharp and C sharp. Here we go. D major, E minor, F sharp minor, G major, A major, B minor, C sharp diminished, back to D major. Okay, now we're in three sharps in the key of A. Those three sharps are F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp. Here we go. A major, B minor, C sharp minor, D major, E major, F sharp minor, G sharp diminished, and back to A major. The highest volume key signature we're going to go to is four sharps, and that's going to be for the key of E major. And that's F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, and D sharp. Here are the chords in E major. E major, F sharp minor, G sharp minor, A major, B major, C sharp minor, D sharp diminished, and back to E major. And I kind of closed the voicing there for that, that high E, but we could also have gone down to here. Let's play them as high closed voicings. E major, F sharp minor, we could even go G sharp minor there or here. Here's A major, B major, C sharp minor, here's our D sharp diminished, and we're back to E major. If you can play all these chords, even as open chords, you can claim each of these major keys and say that I can play any chord in any of these major keys. Now, I just want to make a quick note to remind you that although these are triads, there exist harmonized scales for sevenths as well. The major one is a major seven, then we've got a minor seven, a minor seven, a major seven. This is called a major minor seven, better known as a dominant seventh. Then here's our minor seven, and then we have something here called the minor seven flat five. That's usually what it's known as, but it's technically a half diminished seventh. And then we're back to the major seven. Just a quick flyby, just playing these on guitar in open position first. This is C major seven, D minor seven, E minor seven, F major seven. You could play it like this too. Uh, this is a G dominant seven, A minor seven, and the B minor seven flat five, and back to C major seven. And if you want a closed voicing, here you go. This is C major seven, D minor seven, E minor seven, F major 7, G dominant 7, A minor 7, um, B minor 7 flat 5, and we're back to C major 7. So those are some diatonic chords for, those are the diatonic chords for the first five major keys for guitar. Okay, now let's take some of this knowledge that we've been developing and put it to use. I'm sure you've probably heard the expression transposing or transposition. That's exactly what we're going to do. So these Roman numerals that we've placed above each of these chords, they have a flexible meaning because depending on which chord you're playing, its relationship to the other chords in the key is based on what those Roman numerals are telling you. So for instance, if I were to take the Roman numerals major one, major four, minor two, and major five, one, four, two, five, and I were to ask you to play the chords associated with those Roman numerals in the key of C major, could you do it? Well, let's try, okay? The one, which is the tonic, is C. The four is F. The two is D minor. And the five is G major. Okay, so let's strum this with the Presbyterian strum and play it in rhythm. One, two, three, four. The chord numbers are one, four, two, five. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting because what we're going to do is we're going to transpose that to another key. Just to be consistent, I'm going to move through the sharps in the key signatures. We're going to move to the key of G. Could you play 1, 4, 2, and 5 in the key of G? Let's try it. 1, 2, ready, go. This is 1, 4, 2, 5. Chords are G, C, A minor, Congratulations.
equations, you've just transposed a chord progression. Let's try it in D. Two, three, four. D, G, E minor, A. This is one, four, two, five, one. Okay, let's try it in the key of A. Two, three, four. A, D, B minor, E, A, D, B minor, E. The Roman numerals, one, four, two, five. Back to one. Okay, let's do it in E major now. Two, three, four, one, four, two, five. One. Okay, so that's transposition. Now what you can do is take a sequence of chords that you hear on a recording or that you see written on a page and analyze them. Say, okay, what are those Roman numerals in relation to each other? Now, we aren't always going to start with the tonic or the one. Um, and also, we're not always going to end on the tonic. Plus, there are going to be inversions, and then there are going to be chords that are not diatonic to the key. For now, I'm going to just keep it simple and we'll basically play and start with the tonic and we'll play in, in root position chords, okay? So let's say I play the sequence C major, A minor, F major, G major. Those four chords in the key of C have specific Roman numeral locations in our system here and it's one, minor six, major four, two, major five, which is the dominant chord, okay? Let's try that in rhythm, let's use the piano strum. Two, three, four, one, six, four, five. I'd like to test your ear a little bit more. We're going to move to the key of G major now. I'm going to play you G, D, C, and then E minor. What are those Roman numerals? Let's play it in rhythm with the piano strum and say the Roman numerals. Two, three, four, one, five, four, six. Back to one, five, four, six. Back to one. Okay, so that's G major. Let's move to the key of D major. Our sequence is D major, G major, B minor to A major. And those are two, three, four, one, Four, six, five. This is major one, major four, minor six, major five, back to one. Okay, take this slow if it's hard to, to hear what those Roman numerals are because this is really going to bless you in your playing. Let's do, do A major now. I'm going to do A major, C sharp minor, move sequentially to D major and E major. So this would be one, minor three, the key of E major. Let's do E, B, F sharp minor, and A. And what are those Roman numerals? See if you can say it with me as I strum in tempo. One, two, three, four. One, five, two, four. There, one, five, minor, two, four, and two, one. Okay, so what's the application of this? How is this useful to you? Well, basically, if you can hear a progression or even see it written down on a piece of music or a lead sheet, you can say, okay, I know what those chords are in relation to the key that we're in. I like the way this sounds. I'd like to play it. So you can listen for the Roman numerals if you're listening to a recording, or you can sense where they're going on a piece of sheet music and then learn to play it. But then you can take it a step further. If you don't like the position or the chord or the key that you're in, you can move to any of these other keys that I've discussed with you C, G, D, A, or E, and transpose that sequence to something more suitable for your voice or for your hands. If you like to play certain shapes, that is all possible on the guitar. The only thing I would encourage you not to do is learn all the chords in the key of G and then just use a capo to slide up the guitar. Because in my opinion, that's, that's not using the guitar for what it allows you to do. And it's kind of using the capo as a crutch. Um, but you have to start somewhere. 
So take these transposition ideas and chordal analysis ideas and run with them. Uh, one other thing I want to let you know about is that these chords are not just the chords that exist in this table. We can move the table around a little bit too. You can rearrange the rows to create the caged keys. If you've heard of the caged system, which is a subject for another class, you can see that if I rearrange these rows, the chords of C, G, D, A, and E become the, the keys of C, A, G, E, and D, and that spells caged. So the left-hand column of chords shows the caged keys. And then you can take these chords that exist in these keys and, of course, play scales based on these, these chords or arpeggios, etc. Um, also, if you know the chords in the key of C major, this is a wonderful gift that music has for you. You also know the chords in A minor, based on the harmonized A natural minor scale. In other words, C major has a relative minor key, which is down a minor third, and that is A minor. This might be new to you, this might be very familiar to you, but for the sake of just running through this, I'm going to rearrange the columns in my diagram to start with A minor, which is the sixth degree, and I'm going to have that be my new one degree. So we'll have the minor one, which is a lowercase one, okay, and then the diminished two, which we may not use, but it's there, the major three, the minor four, the minor five, the major six, the major seven, and back to the minor one. Okay, so if you know the chords in the key of C major, you also know the chords in the key of A minor. If you know the chords in the key of G major, you also know the chords in the key of E minor. If you know the chords in the key of D major, you also know all the chords diatonically to the key of B minor. If you know the chords in the key of A major, you know the chords that exist diatonically in F sharp minor. And if you know the chords in the key of E major, you know all the chords diatonically in the key of C sharp minor. When you're in the minor key of A minor, one, four, and five are the minor chords. And then three, six, and seven are the major chords. And then there's the diminished two, okay? So let's say in A minor, you wanted to play one major five, ma sorry, one minor five, major six, and major seven. You would have A minor, E minor, F major, G major, and you could create a cool groove on that. That's some helpful information regarding transposition and chordal analysis. I'd like to close this section by adding a few more helpful tools to help make the music sound even more interesting. This is just going to be scratching the surface, but I'm hoping it'll inspire you to press on. For instance, I want to take chords that are root position and I want to play them in inversions. So this is a D major chord. We just take the A note, we put it in the bass, and we have a D over A, which is kind of interesting. You can take the third, which is the F sharp, and put that in the bass, and we've got a D over F sharp, which is the first inversion, which makes it kind of a non-final non chord, but it still has a good sound to it. You can do this all day long. This is A major, A major over E. You can put the C, in, C sharp in the bass. Here's E major with G sharp in the bass, etc. Okay, so to put this into use, I have one particular song where I have the chords that go from C to G to A minor to A minor seven to D major to D minor, and then I finish up with an E major. Okay, so my bass notes for root position are C, G, A, A, D, D, and E, which they're kind of wonky. They're just kind of bouncing all over the place. But if I incorporate the use of inversions on a couple of these interspersed chords, it can sound kind of nice. So here's a C major chord. Then I'm going to move to a G over B. Here's my A minor. I'm going to put this into a minor seven with a seven in the bass. And then here's a D major in first inversion. So D over F sharp. I'm going to turn it into a minor chord, D minor over F. And I'm going to finish up with an E suspended four, which we'll talk about in a moment with suspensions. 
So my bass line went from to this. And listen to that voice leading as I play these chords. It's kind of nice. The inversions can certainly be a helpful tool. Let's take a moment to talk about suspensions. When you are in suspense, your relaxed state has been taken away from you temporarily and you're on the edge of your seat. Or if you've had your license suspended, it's been taken away temporarily, so you have to find a new way to get around, whether you're taking the bus, your mom's driving you around, you're riding a bike, something like that. But eventually, the suspense is resolved, so you can relax back into your seat, or you can get your license back. So what happens is we're taking a member of a chord, and we're temporarily suspending it, and replacing it with another member of the chord. And generally speaking, we're taking the third, and we're basically replacing it with the fourth or the second. Let's put this onto the fretboard right here. Here's a D major chord. Okay, the major third is F sharp. Okay, let's suspend that by adding the fourth instead. Okay, that's a D suspended four. I'm sure you've probably seen D sus four. Okay, let's suspend and add the second instead. So this is D major, D sus four, D sus two. Okay, now the suspension chord works best in context, and there are always exceptions, and you can break the rules of theory, but generally the suspension works best as the five chord leading back to the one chord. So we suspend the five. So in the key of G, G is one, C is four, and D is five. So what we can do is we can hold this G note and prepare it, and then create this tension with suspension, and then resolve it. Okay, so listen to this note right here as it goes through the changes of G, C, D sus4 back to G. Okay, it's nice and satisfying to the ear. Uh, also, you can take a seventh chord like D7, and you can also suspend the four like this. Okay, you can do that with A. You can do it with E sus4. You can do sus2. You can do this up the neck too. Okay, so it's a movable figure. Suspension can be really nice to add to your playing. Um, chordal embellishment, that's adding notes that are not already a part of the chord. And this takes us into a whole realm of exciting musicality. For instance, let's take the, the E major chord. Your garden variety E major chord. That's, that's fine. Um, but let's say we took the first degree and we brought it up and we added the second degree. This is different from suspending the second because we are still going to keep the third. Okay, so this is what's called an, an E add nine. It's got that extra little bit of seasoning to make it kind of nice and it's this major second with a little bit of dissonance. You can do this on an A, do it on a D, on a C. There it is, and then a G, okay. Um, you can also do this in minor too. Take an E minor chord, take that root and bring it up to the second degree and you've got an E minor add nine. You can add the seven there if you want, the D. So you've got an E where you're adding the F sharp, adding the D, and then Let's make it even richer. Let's add the 11. This is the A. Very pretty chord. Much more interesting in my opinion than your garden variety E minor, which is a place to start. But if this is vanilla, and add all those ice cream toppings, you got one tasty sundae, I'm telling you. You can also take away the quality of the chord from major to minor and just make it a five chord. No gender quality to it, it's not major or minor. You can move that and play it as a movable bar five as well. So hopefully this section on the harmonic aspect will give you some inspiration and some handy tools to allow you to listen to music and see it and move it around and basically take the chords that you're hearing and using, take them to a new level, claim them, use them, transpose them. 
understand them so that you can play these progressions more intentionally and intelligently and then come up with your own chord progressions. Well, I hope this lesson has been helpful to you. I hope it's inspired you. And I hope I've given you some tools that you can immediately put to use, as well as some concepts you can work on over the coming weeks, months, and years in your guitar journey, using your music to glorify God. I mentioned at the beginning of this class that I am a songwriter, a performer, and a worship leader. And I would be honored and delighted to connect with you regarding the possibility of serving at your church as a guest performer, a guest worship leader, and even a guest clinician teaching some of my seminars. If you're interested in knowing more about my ministry, my first name is David, my last name is Harsh, and my website is www.davidharsh.com. I've had a wonderful time serving you. I'll see you next time. Into the sinking sand, or I can stand on solid ground. And if I clap, and if I pray, may these hands you gave me always point the way. And if I walk, and if I run, may the path I take lead others to your son. And wherever I may go, and whatever I may do. You gave me always more the way And if I walk And if I run May the path I take lead others to your son And wherever I may go And whatever I may do May these four limbs you've given me Bring honor, praise, and glory Bye.